Brother Desmond Rogers. Brother Desmond. Amen. Amen. Indeed, Brother Jomo. I've got a feeling everything will be all right with your singing too. Amen. You aren't a wonderful singer, so some things might be rubbing off. Amen. Amen. We have hope. We both have hope. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 What a joy to serve the Lord. What a joy to serve the Lord. You know, I don't know how people make out without Christ, you know. I just wonder how people make out without Christ. Amen. Today we continue the subject of patience. Patience. And thank you for your patience. The last, uh, when I began the series, uh, I said that a Friday night uh, we were going to continue. Uh, it so happened that that night was the same week uh, when my mom passed away. The very next day I was traveling um, to the U.S. And so though I showed up in a service, we had a different kind of service, a different kind of ministry with different kind of meeting on, on that Friday night. And so I'm continuing part two of the subject of patience. Patience. You've heard the story already, I'm sure, if you haven't, uh, but I'm going to tell you. A story that happened a long time ago, but it's well documented. It's one of those moving stories that are told as an example of endurance, of patience, of staying the course regardless of the hardships that we face in life. And that story is embodied in something that happened in 1968, a long time ago. But the story is still relevant today. In Mexico City, it was the 1968 Olympics, Mexico City. It was one of those races that people already come out to see. The sprints and the marathons are the big races in the Olympics. And the marathon race... The Africans were the favorites to win. And among those was an excellent runner, long-distance runner, John Stephen Aquari. He was in that race, and it so happened that it was a very bad day for him. It was a final race. It was a race to take home the medal. And long after the other athletes had crossed the finishing line, while the stadium was being emptied, a long time after, came one man hobbling, struggling, bruised, but with a determination to cross the finishing line. He could have dropped out. He could have given up. Because, in a sense, there was no real reason for him to continue on that grueling course to finish that race. And so when they ask him, the journalists ask him, Mr. Quarry, they put a microphone to him and ask him, tell us, why did you put yourself through that to finish this race? Why did you do that to yourself? Obviously, you couldn't have won anything. He said something very interesting. And these words are immortalized today. They're there for reference. They're there as words of encouragement. Words that lift the human spirit. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, maybe you started some things. And maybe struggles and challenges and difficulties have come along in your path that are causing you now to reconsider dropping out of that race, regardless of what it might be. The students who graduated from university yesterday, three graduations yesterday, were three ceremonies. One convocation class, three ceremonies. There are stories upon stories upon stories. Each person who graduated must have had a story to tell on the graduation night. There are many who would have told of the times when they didn't have a cent to take them to campus. Or even if they got to campus, they did not have a cent to take them back home. And therefore expected the generosity of a classmate to get them back to at least some point near their home. There are those who would tell of the days and nights when they spent on campus 
without anything to eat, maybe just drinking some water, or maybe not even having water to drink, couldn't afford to buy a bottle of water. There are those who could tell of the times when they showed up and the bursary would be sending them notices that they would have to drop out of this course or that course because they have not yet paid their tuition fees. There are those who would have had to do an exam over and over and over again because all they keep getting from that course might be a failing grade. There are those who would have told of the times when their parents or a loved one or their children fell ill and they had to choose between staying to look at this loved one and trying to submit an assignment to complete that course. And I'm sure the stories would have gone on and on and on if we had a chance to listen to them. But you know what? They all had one story to tell last night. I've made it through. I've come to the end. I've finished this course. Brothers and sisters, you see, some of us have been taught that the Christian life is a bed of roses. There is nowhere in Scripture you'll find that. The Scripture tells us very clearly that in me, in Jesus, you shall have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation, trials, testings, difficulties. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So in other words, there are going to be challenges. There are going to be days when you have nothing to eat. There are going to be days when you'll be staring a loved one on a sick bed and wondering, throwing up your arms, God, why is this happening now? There are going to be days and times when your marriage will be on the rocks so you're wondering, how do I survive this? There are going to be days and times maybe when there's a loved one breaking your heart in pain because the outcome of your life is not what you've expected. There might even be days and times when you receive a medical report as not what you're looking for. Not now. But brothers and sisters, that's the stuff life is made of. But you know what? We don't have to journey alone. We don't have to give in. We don't have to give up. We don't have to throw our arms and, 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 and in despair. God is with us. That's the comfort that a Christian has. Not that we will have no problems. Not that we will have no difficulties. Not that we will have no challenges. We will, we will, we will. If you're looking for a challenge-free life, the Christian life is not that life. Because I tell you, the opposite is true. When you become a Christian, you'll have more challenges to face. But you would not be alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. That's a promise that we have in the Lord. And so the Lord is challenging us, calling upon us to stay the course. Don't give up. Let patience be that virtue. Let patience be the characteristic in our lives, in our individual lives, in our professional lives, in our ministry. The story is told of, of course, it is method, it's a story to make a point. It's not theological, Brother Joe. So don't hold me the call, over the calls for my theology. But it's a story that makes a point. In heaven, St. Peter was taking... And some people start to get nervous when they hear St. Peter. That's why, that's why I'm struggling there because I have three theologians in the front here and two over this side too. These are all Bible school graduates. Who's taking this man through the storehouse of heaven? And there were many shelves with unwrapped packages. There were many shelves with neatly wrapped packages unopened. Un Did I say unwrapped? Yes. Unopened, unopened. They were still wrapped. And the man asked, St. Peter, I'm new around here. I just came up. But my curiosity fills me. What is the meaning of all of these unopened, still very neatly wrapped packages? And St. Peter said, those are the packages that were to be delivered. Those were the packages that were almost off the delivery list. Those were the packages that were waiting to be delivered. And the only way they're delivered is through the intercession of the saints. 
He said, oh, that's why he said they're almost at the edge of the shelf. He said, yes, they were almost off the shelf. But those who were supposed to be recipients of those packages, they stopped praying a little bit before the package came off the shelf. Brothers and sisters, that is not song theology. But I tell you, it makes a point that there are times when we give up just before, just before, just before the answer comes. There are times when we give up, the answer is well nigh us. The answer is about to come our way. But because we've been filled with pressure and uh, disappointment and waiting and all of that, we give up. If you're a student today and you're about to turn your back on your course of studies, you just don't give up. If you're a parent today and you have a child giving you sleepless nights, I want to say to you, don't give up. If you're a spouse and the other person, your partner, your wife or your husband, is still in that mode of stressing you out for whatever reason, I want to say to you, don't give up. If you are in that place of employment and you're thinking, I can turn my back on this, I don't have to stick this anymore, I want to say to you, don't give up. Brothers and sisters, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. If you stay the course, if we stay the course, there will be a time when we give the glory to God. So patience is what we are longing for. Patience is what God wants us to have. It's a virtue. It's a necessary character trait. Patience is, brothers and sisters, a gift that God wants us to have. We only have to look at the scriptures to see so many saints of God, so many men and women of God who did not exhibit patience. And the consequences were catastrophic. When we think of Abraham received the word from God. He and his wife Sarah were going to have a child. A child of promise. And you know what? Sometimes I think God has this way of drawing. Of perfecting patience in us. But according to their clock. According to the social clock. The biological clock. And maybe even the physical clock. According to their modus operandi, according to the way of the world, according to the way they see things, according to the cultural norms, they were not seeing the fulfillment of that promise. And they felt that they had to help God because somehow they bought into the cultural thinking that God helps those who help themselves. In other words, let me try to help God, but God does not need help. All God wants us to do is to stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Of course, time was running out. Of course, it had taken a long time for the fulfillment of that promise. But God is never in a hurry. God is never in a hurry. God is always on time. And they took matters into their own hands with a bright scheme to hasten the fulfillment of the prophetic word, they went outside of God's will. And all the problems in the world today, especially in the East, is all of that. Jews and the Arabs and all of that was as a result of that one decision to be impatient and to try to fulfill things the human way. We think of Samson. We think of Saul. We think of the prodigal son. We think of so many people in scriptures who sought to do things their way and the consequences were disastrous. I want to say to us, brothers and sisters, God wants us to wait. God wants us to exhibit, it, uh, to exhibit patience. God wants us to persevere. God wants us to press on. God wants us to demonstrate patience. Patience is something that we need if we can be successful in life and in ministry. How do we get patience? How do we get patience? If patience is so necessary, how do we get patience? Let me tell you this. I hardly think, I cannot find a scripture to support the idea that patience comes with the laying on of hands. Be patient, brother. In Jesus' name, you're patient. 
That is not how patience. There's some things that come by the laying on of hands. And I'm almost sure, based on the scriptural understanding that I have, that laying on of hands, patience does not come by the laying on of hands. There's no short circuit for patience. God takes us through experiences in life so that we can be patient. I once heard the story of this fisherman who was selling fish. He brought fish from the sea. I was trying to sell fish to the hotels in that area. But everywhere he went to sell his fish, they said we only want living fish. But he had no way of, of keeping his fish alive until he got to shore. And so he went and all the fishermen who gave him an idea. It's like developing patience. He said, you know what? I want you when you catch those fish, the tuna, the muffins, the, all the different fish that you can catch. I want you to get one fish. It's called the barracuda. I don't know if you know about the barracuda fish. But the barracuda, let me go on to tell you the story. You'll understand the barracuda. So the, 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 the man caught this, a huge catch of fish, put it in the tank there, and then he got this barracuda. Because why the fish died before he got the land is because the fish had nothing to do. They were just resting there. But this barracuda is a fish that will attack all the other fish in the tank. If you only had to rest, the barracuda shoots at you. And so what they had to do was to swim for their life. Was to dodge and hide and move away from the barracuda. That kept them awake. That kept them alert. That kept them alive. There was, anytime they lapsed and they want to go to sleep, the barracuda came. Would spoil them, would torture them, would torment them, would give them pain. But you know what? All of them were delivered alive because of the barracuda. I want to say to us, there might be barracudas in your lives. There might be people who just come to torment you. But their purpose in life is to help you to fulfill your purpose. And you don't even know it. There might be situations in life that come your way and you think you are giving up, but that situation is destined to bring you to the purpose that God has in store for you. So you know what produces patience? Not the laying on of hands. It's going through trials and suffering. That is God's idea to produce patience in us. So anybody tells you, come let me give you a laying on of hands and be thou patient. As a short, we love that kind of thing. It's like, it's like, it's like instant coffee. It's like fast food. You just walk up, you collect it, and you go on your way. That's a, but I tell you, when God takes us through experiences, is for us to be patient. We are called to be patient in the face of suffering. James says in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, Be thou patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. Patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, James is writing in a context where the believers were facing diverse trials, diverse troubles, where their lives were under persecution where they were facing dark, uh, dark and terrible times. And James says, in the midst of all of that, be patient. In the midst of all the troubles and trials, be patient. Let me tell you, patience is a beautiful thing. Impatience is a terrible thing. Impatience has its consequences. You pay dearly for impatience. So, it is an imperative. It is a command. We are called to be Patient. We're called to be patient because we know one thing. Even if we don't receive the reward that we are looking forward to, one thing is sure, the coming of the Lord. That keeps us going. That keeps us strong. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with patience, with perseverance. The race marked out for us. 
looking, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, brothers and sisters, listen to this, he endured the cross, discarding his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we have him as an example. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In other words, we have Jesus as an example. Brothers and sisters, be patient. There will be contradiction. There will be opposition. There will be difficulties. There will be torment. There will be trials. Whatever we might be facing, we know that we are not going at the loan. Jesus endured all of those things. And he did it with joy. For the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. And now, here is the reward. He's seated at the right hand. He's seated at the throne of God. He's seated in glory. Brothers and sisters, if we endure, the blessings will be ours. If we persevere, the blessings will be ours. There will be contradictions. There will be people who will tell you, this can't be done. There will be people who will tell you, why are you wasting your time? There will be the naysayers. There will be those who will tell you, that is not meant for you. Maybe in your own head, you will tell yourself that. You? Which member of your family ever had a degree? You not on university material? You? You know marriage material? You? Living in that house, in that area? You? Look where you come from. Why are you thinking you can achieve that, brothers and sisters? Those are things that will come to frustrate us. Those are things that will come to discourage us. Those were things that will come to hold us back. But I tell you, that if we keep our eyes looking onto Jesus, fix upon Jesus. If we keep our eyes fixed on what God has said to us, God can and will bring us through. All you have to do is to hold on tight. All you have to do is to hold on tight. All you have to do is endure. Endurance will bring you through. So we have Jesus as an example. So in the face of stubborn contradictions of faith, we can also hold on to the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Waiting patiently is not always a characteristic demonstrated by today's 21st century people. Waiting patiently. That waiting sometimes, if you're prepared to wait, I must confess, uh, it seems easier to stand and walk around and pace the floor than to sit patiently and wait. Oh, Mr. John will be with you shortly. Please sit and wait. And I said, especially if you have a, something else going on. He said, I said, no, I prefer to stand because somehow you think by that activity of going around there that you're decreasing the time. That patience of waiting patiently in the Lord, that gives us the benefit. So the psalmist says, be still Wait, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. So we can be tempted to give up because why am I trying to do it the right way when everybody taking a shortcut and they seem to be applauded? Why am I trying to do this or that when everybody seems to be getting through? Though they're doing it the wrong. One of my mom's favorite songs, we sang it at the funeral too. Tempted and tried, we're off me to wonder. Why it should be thus all the day long? Somebody got to help me here now. Say that. While there are others living among us, never molested, though in the wrong. You know, you can ask yourself, like a psalmist here in Psalm 37, there are those who are so wicked. There are those who are so full of evil. And when you look at them, you seem as if they are prospering. And you're, 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 you're tempted to not only just ask yourself, you may be tempted even to give up. But I tell you what, brothers and sisters, be patient. Wait patiently in the Lord. God will come true. You will see it happen. There are those who will have received a vision. Habakkuk says that when you receive that vision, wait for it. Do it, tarry. The appointed time will come where God will bring the fulfillment of that vision. 
Oh, sometimes we long to see the fulfillment, the manifestation of the word of God. But I tell you what, if it's a genuine word of God, you don't have to force God's hand to make it happen. It's a, if it's a genuine word from God, God will fulfill it in his time, in his ways. You don't have to do anything contrary to God's word to make it happen. You've got to fulfill what God wants you to fulfill because there might be con conditions to that word. But once you fulfill the conditions of that word, God is going to make it happen. In the early 1800s, there was a man named Adoniram Judson, a missionary from the United States of America. He went to a place called Burma. It's renamed today. Anybody can tell me the name of that place now? Myanmar. Thank you, Brother Harry. is always in the current affairs. Myanmar. Perhaps the most popular citizens of Myanmar. Anybody knows? Aung San Suu Kyi. That's right. Uh, she's always in the news. The face of pro-democratic move. Or else we want to bring change. And always, I mean, she's been under house arrest, in prison, and all of that, and so on. Strongly supported by the West. But Adoniram Judson and his wife went to work in Burma as missionaries. 25 years old, he left with his young wife. As a matter of fact, on their way to on a missionary voyage, she miscarried their first child. He labored and labored and labored. For the job for 10 years, 12 years, 20 years. For 20 years, they couldn't count 10, mission, 10 converts. And people would think, well, that's a waste of time. You're in this area for such a long time and then you don't see all of these converts. You guys are wasting time here. Brothers and sisters, all we have to do is to be faithful to God. That is what God has called us to do. Sometimes we think we have to be superstars. We will not be commended by the Lord for our superstarness. We will be com commended for our faithfulness. We will hear, well done, thou good and faithful. Faithful is staying the course. It's fulfilling what God has called us to fulfill. Sometimes, you know, we want to be that flash in the pan. We want to demonstrate that we can make it happen. It does not depend upon us. It depends upon faithfulness and God will do the rest. But I tell you, in Myanmar today, former, formerly Burma today, Myanmar, you go there, the church is alive and thriving. Because while Adon Adoniram Judson was, he lost two wives while he was serving there. He was in prison, severely tortured. Uh, people thought that this is a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. It's an investment of your life. It's here in the call of God and fulfilling what God has called you to fulfill. He stayed the course. While he was there, he wrote what became a copy of the New Testament. He said he translated the Bible, beginning with the New Testament. Laid the foundations for the translation. Today, the church in Myanmar, those still strongly Buddhists, those still strongly opposed to the gospel, is a thriving church because one man, it wasn't just him alone, there were others who went before him, but he was the person who probably had the most notable uh, impact in that area. He stayed the course. He was patient. What am I saying today, brothers and sisters? God will be calling you and calling me. God will be calling us as a church and as individuals, individually and collectively, to fulfill his call. When we look at Israel, when we look at Rasmus, when we look at the work and work and rust in Sophia, in board and in different places of ministry which we work, our departments, sometimes the enemy can come to us and tell us, why are you wasting time? Why do you keep going after this? Why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep doing this? Brothers and sisters, God has called us to be faithful because we know that if we are patient, we will see the harvest. James tells us one of the first scriptures we read, James tells us of the farmer who patiently waits. He sows the seed. He waters. He patiently, you know what? That's one process you can't rush. These days they have genetic modification and stuff that they do to increase, to, to not just the, the yield, but increase the, the growth of the plant. But you know what? It could never be like a genuine stuff. For one, that they're destructive to your body. That's why you have so many cancers and all of that these days. But two, they would never taste as genuine and as real as when that fruit is given time to grow and ripe properly. I tell you what, brothers and sisters, whatever God has called you to sow, keep sowing. Whatever God has called you to do, keep doing it. 
keep doing it. God wants us to understand that he is calling us to fulfill his purposes. What are the challenges that you face? What is it that God might have called you to that you are tempted to give up on right now? Where are you in terms of an understanding of God's call in your life and your ministry? There are many people who give up at ministry because the devil tells them that this is no time for, for keep going. There are many people who sabotage their future, their call on God because they yield to the lies of the devil. The devil comes to you and says to you, why do you keep going? Why do you keep yielding? Why do you keep surrendering? Now it's time to give up. Tell somebody next year, now it's not the time to give up. Tell them, now it's not the time to give up. Let us be patient. Tell them, be patient. Tell somebody else, be patient. Patience is something that we all need to have. Patience is something that we all need to have. The church at Thessalonica, Paul boasted, Paul said in Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4, that we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Sounds like, sounds like South Road Church to me. The love we have one for another is increasing even more and more. Hello, South Road is a family church. South Road is a family church. South Road, not because I have been a recipient of the blessings of being part of this family. I know South Road is a family church. We look out for each other. We support each other. We stand by each other. Our love for each other reaches out more and more and more. Brothers and sisters, one of the things Paul says about this church is of their patience. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance, verse 4, and faith, your perseverance, your patience, your pressing on in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. What a commendation. What a word. What a testimony this church had. And in the midst of their trials and persecutions, they keep going on and on and on. If you have two young lovers... You know the way to keep them together is to try to separate them. Try to persecute them. You try to bring it on. The way to keep them together somehow, persecution, when it comes between a love relationship, helps to bring them together. You look at that. Two young lovers. You want to see them stick close to each other? Is that a third party come? Like your parents, like your, some big brother or something like that, come to set them apart? It's like they stick even closer to each other. That's the thing of persecution. It, it activates. It stimulates. It brings some more attachment together. The strongest church today it is felt is the Chinese church. The church in China. The most thriving church. As a matter of fact, the most numerous. You have to give it to them for that. But in terms of their commitment to Christ, in terms of their commitment, you know what? And they are persecuted. They are persecuted. Some of them are imprisoned. Some of them are, 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 are executed. Not just persecuted, but executed, martyred. All kinds of stuff happening to them. Sometimes they leave their country to go to a Christian gathering in some of the country. Though they know that when they return home, they will be stopped at the airport and be all collected. And they will be charged and sometimes imprisoned. Persecution is not going to cause them to give up. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we give up in the face of the slightest of problems. Sometimes we throw in the towel. Sometimes we turn our backs on the Lord. Sometimes we give up our faith in Christ because of something that scratched our head. Somewhere somebody look at you. I'm going back to that church. I don't like all these people looking at me. A woman asked Brother Shambach once. She went to Shambach and she said, Brother Shambach... Please pray for me. Shamak said, why should I pray for you? Oh, they're calling me names. So what names are they calling you? They're calling me Holy Rolly. Shamak said, woman, if you cannot take a name like that, you cannot make heaven your home. Brothers and sisters, the little things in life that sometimes trip us up and throw us off course. God wants us to let us run the race with patience. That razor is set before us. Let's endure the sufferings, the trials 
that may come our way. I want to close by telling us today that if you're going to be a man of God, if you're going to be a woman of God, if you're going to be an elder, an apostle, if you're going to be a faithful servant, if we're going to be a church committed to Christ, if we're going to be a church fulfilling what God has called us to fulfill, individually or collectively, patience has got to be the all mark. You look at it. To be an apostle, one of the all marks is patience. Paul says, you know my manner of life. Second Corinthians was writing when they were even questioning his credibility as an apostle. He said, you know my manner of life, my doctrine. You know my patience. He said, Timothy, one of the all marks of your life, thou man of God, is to be patient. The church of Jesus Christ has got to be a patient church. Sometimes we want things to happen, happen now. We want to make things happen now. But you know what? God is calling us to be patient. The one prayer that I want to ask us to pray is, Lord, make us patient. Lord, make me patient. And you know what will come your way when you ask God to make you patient? You know what will come? Don't come in any line. I'm not going to call for any line to make you patient today. I'm not going to lay my hands on you. You know what will come? The testings will come. The trials will come. That's right. Thank you, Brother Harold. The Romans, the number of scriptures, including Romans 5. 5.3. Five, the trial of your faith, brothers and sisters, work at patience. When patience will have its perfect work, you shall be entire, complete, lacking nothing. Patience has got to be worked out in each one of us. Lord, make us a patient church. Make us patient for the coming of the Lord. Lord, make us patient, Lord God, so that we can look with hope and earnest expectation for the coming of the Lord. There are those who would say, where is the Lord? Where is the coming of the Lord? Since our fathers, before our fathers fell asleep a long time ago, we heard the word the Lord was coming. Where is he now? You don't have to fall to the trap of thinking that Jesus is not coming again. Be patient, brothers and sisters. He's coming again. He's coming again. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. But he's patient also. He's giving us a chance to repent. Both for the non-Christian and the Christian as well. Get your life together. Get your act together. None of us knows the day or the hour when the Lord will come. The Lord is giving us a chance to fulfill his purposes. In your ministry, be patient. You may not be seeing all that God wants you to see right now. But you be patient. You keep going. You keep going. You keep going. You hum along. You sing your song. You do your thing. And you keep going. God, in his faithfulness, will bring you through. God will bring you through. Maybe no one sees and applauds and honors you. But God will. God will. God will. This missionary who was coming back on, on, on Farlow, coming back home, two missionaries. And there were people that were traveling on a boat and everybody was in the harbor waiting to receive their loved ones. And there were people who were there greeting and loving and, and, and they were so happy to receive their loved ones who had been away for a long time. When this young missionary stepped out, there was nobody to greet them. When this young missionary stepped out, his heart was broken because there was no one to give them a big hug and a big kiss and have the, the welcome home sign there. And he turned to the older missionary and said, why is no one here to greet us? They had written to the church. They had written to their friends. They had written to their families and said, we are coming home. They gave the details of when the ship will arrive. They certainly had received that message. And yet there was no one at the harbor to receive them. And he was broken. He asked the old missionary, why is no one here to receive us? And the old missionary gave him a pat on the shoulder and said, no one is here to receive us because we are not home yet. We are not home yet. We are not home yet. Brothers and sisters, patience. When we arrive home, there's going to be a big welcome sign. When we arrive home, there is going to be a great crowd waiting for us. In the meantime, Hebrews 12 tells us there are those who are encouraging us to go on. May the Lord help us not to stumble. Even if we stumble, get up and run again. 
get up and run again. Even if you're like John Stephen Aquari, bruised. Even if you're running a race and you're not seeing others around you, know that it's not time to give up. You have a great cloud of witnesses telling you, keep going, keep going, keep going. May the Lord help us today. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you, Lord, help us to keep going. Lord, help me to keep going. Lord God, help us as a church to keep going. Lord, help my brothers and sisters to keep going. Lord God, in the midst of their financial difficulties, help them to keep going. Lord, in the midst of their difficulties at school, help them to keep going. Lord, in the midst of their difficulties at college and university and technical institute, or wherever they find themselves at this time, oh God, help them to keep going, oh God. Lord, in the midst of their marital issues, help them to keep going. In the midst of their issues with their children and loved ones, help them to keep going. In the midst of their challenges, Lord God, in terms of their faith, in terms of their ministry, in terms of all you have called them to, Lord. Lord God, even when a prophetic word seems so distant, Lord, even when a prophetic word seems so remote, even when that fulfillment, oh God, is nothing in between hands reach, oh God. Keep us going, oh God, we pray. Keep us going. Keep us going, oh God. Lord, stir it in us. Stir it in us, oh God. Oh, God, in the midst of the trials and the persecutions, keep us going. Keep us going, Lord, we pray. Keep us going. Keep us going, oh, God. Keep us going. Keep us going, Lord. Lord, keep us going, Lord. Lord, in the midst of all that we see around us, oh, God. In the midst of all that we see around us, oh, God, God that can take our eyes off, Lord, God. What you've called us to, Lord, God. Keep us going, Lord. Oh, God, keep us going. Lord God, we thank you for the fulfillment of the prophetic word that you have given to us. We thank you for the call that you have placed upon our lives. Keep us going, oh God. Keep us going, Lord. Keep us patient, Lord. Lord, enduring, oh God. Persevering, oh God. Waiting, oh God. Because we know that you will bring us through. Thank you, Lord God, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I should have said this before, but if you are desirous of praying in this 7 o'clock service next week, we're not going to ask for a show of hands today. I'm going to ask you to give your names to Brother Philip Sandy, our church administrator. As if you desire to pray in the 7 o'clock service, during the 7 o'clock service next week. I'm going to ask you to give your, your names to Brother Philip. We thank God for Sister Florine who is praying today. Thank you, Sister Florine. If you want to pray next week, do give your names to Brother Philip. Lord, keep us going. May God help you today. Lord, I pronounce your blessings upon your people. Lord, in the midst of the challenges of life, Lord, we pray, God, that you will bless them, Lord, in unfathomable ways this week. Lord God, I pray, God, in the midst of the challenges, in the midst of the persecutions, in the midst of the difficulties they may face, Lord, grant wisdom, grant grace, grant peace. Lord God, meet their needs, Lord, for those who may have huge bills, Lord God, that they need to settle this week. We ask, oh God, that you provide for them. Lord, for those who need strength, physical strength, Lord God. Lord, even this very day, we ask, oh God, that you would strengthen their bodies. Lord, for those who might be losing hope in some way, renew their hope, renew their confidence, renew their strength in you. For those who wait upon you, Lord God, your word says, shall renew their strength. Lord God, help them to mount up with wings as eagles. Lord God, help them to overcome today, Lord God. Pour out your blessings afresh. Pour out your blessings afresh, Lord. Renew, Lord God, strength. Renew hope. Lord God, we pray, God, for freshness, Lord God, in marriages today. Marriages that might be drying. Marriages, oh God, that the ebb, Lord God, the life might be ebbing away from it, oh God. Let God 
grace, that freshness. Oh God, let a new romance come to marriages, oh God. Lord God, I may be dying, Lord God, at this day. Lord God, we pray in the name of Jesus. Help us with our children, oh God. Oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus. Oh God, we pray, Lord God, that the grace and the patience or the wisdom, Lord God, Lord God, we pray, Lord, do something fresh. Do something new, O oh God, in our midst today. Lord, even for the men and women who go out to minister in their zones today, Lord God. Lord God, give us grace. Give us patience. Do something sweet and beautiful this week in our lives. We pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.